All right. So if we look here, this, remember this function, the sink function is really sine of x or sine of omega tau over two divided by omega tau over two. Well, at this point, the sine of x or the sine of omega tau over two is one. And you're just left, you're really talking about this height right here being tau divided by omega tau over two. I'm sorry. It would be when omega tau over two is equal to three halves pi. And that means get rid of the two or omega tau would be three pi. And This would be three pi over two would be omega tau over two at that point. And so this height would be right here would be tau divided by three pi over two, or it's simply two over three pi tau, or it would be down by two over three pi, whatever that is, um, I probably can tell you. It's going to be a value that's going to be about two over six, so about one third the actual value. Now, what I'm going to tell you is this. These are called, this is the main lobe between here and here that we're interested in. That's the frequency spectrum that just for now, trust me, is, is going to be of great interest. And when we multiply this P tau of T by a high frequency cosine waveform, then this whole thing shifts out to some plus or minus omega naught. And when we actually do filtering to see what's out there, what we like to do is eliminate everything outside of what's called the main lobe right here. Now, the problem is if this thing has a, a high value, a fairly high value, it'll cause problems that I'll explain later. But I want to show you what windowing does to eliminate this. And I'm going to do it with MATLAB. It's a little more right here so you can see it. And then I'm assuming everybody can see this. This is not quite done the way I'd like, but I'll explain this to you. So we're going to have P tau of T normally goes to tau times the sink tau over two. Now, if we have a signal that's just going to be a digital signal, it looks like this. It's going to have some envelope like this where it'll have ones, say a whole bunch of ones here. I mean, this isn't digital, it's a discrete signal and a bunch of zeros here. And then if we take the actual DFT of it or the FFT, now we're gonna get a signal over here that will look like, and I'm not putting down the exact representation, I'm just showing you it. It will look like a sync function and just put it the DPFT or FFT and it will look like this. It will look like a sampled version of that sync waveform. And it'll go up like this and down like this and so forth. That's what I'm about to show you. But if you, if you have enough samples here, it looks like a continuum. Now let me do that next. And I don't know, it's supposed to be autofocus. So let me go over here and just do this for you. Bear with me, this will come together. So I've got a clear all, close all, CLC. Then I let TS, and that's the sampling interval, be one millisecond. Now I'm creating a 64 ones. This is what this command does. And it's the pulse width. Remember, when we talk about doing a DFT or an FFT, the TS is suppressed. They only have values of one, two, three, four, the first sample, second, and so forth. And here I say NW is the length of the actual pulse. That would be equivalent to tau without the time constant multiplied by it. Here, if this is the length of the number of ones, I have 64 ones. If I multiply, multiply by TS, now I actually have the length in time. You follow me on that? All right. Here's the pulse I created. It's just going to be 64 ones and then the rest zeros and it goes out uh, to two to the end. It's going to have two to the 12th. So what is that? Uh, that's, 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 1024 or 20 or 2048, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's a fairly large number. So I have a very short interval in, in, in over this pulse is going to be ones. 
And just to look at it, we'll take a look at what this looks like so everybody will be clear about what it looks like when I do it. And I'm gonna just take plot of, in this case, just uh, my X. And I'm gonna just run this part of the job. And you see, it's a very narrow pulse. Can everybody see that on your screen? Yes. yes. Okay, now we're gonna do the FFT of it. So here I'm doing the FFT, right in, this, in line 17. It is the same thing as the DFT, exact same thing. Then remember the FFT shift takes everything and shifts it so now I can make sense of this thing. It's gonna take the, the, the frequencies from pi to two pi and shift them down from minus pi to pi. And then I have to adjust the frequency axis accordingly. Let me just mention this. Remember now my frequency, this is the frequency, the, the, the associated frequency with the FFT when we adjust it, would be one over NTS. Normally it's two pi over NTS if it was in radians, but I'm gonna do this in Hertz, okay? Everybody with me? And I is simply an index because I have discrete points in the frequency domain. So the actual delta F between points is just one over NTS. I tells you which frequency you're at. Uh, I put omega there just because I may use it later. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna plot this right here. And I'm gonna take a look at what, now this is equivalent to that sync waveform uh, that I just showed you. And I'm gonna rerun the whole thing from here. Now y'all see here, what I have is basically a sync waveform. I have the absolute value. Here's some things to keep in mind. There's a whole lot of information in here, but one thing you can see is most of the signal itself, the signal energy, would be between about minus 50 and plus 50. And the first zero, I think I've talked to you about this before, but if you uh, talk about the first zero, if I have a sync function like this, if I have the sync, right, of X, and I plot it versus X, just take magnitude of sync X versus X, Where's that first zero? Do you remember? Well, the sink of X is equal to what? Sine of X over X, right? We don't care about X. We care about the sine of X. Where's sine of X zero? It's zero at zero. Where's the next zero? Pi. 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 So when the argument of the sink function is pi, that means when the argument of this function right here is pi, so the first zero would be omega tau over two equal pi. That means omega would be equal to two pi over tau. That would be the first zero. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. All right, yep. and that means f would be simply one over tau, first zero. Everybody agree? Yep. I lost somebody, I lost a couple people, I think. Okay, <laughs> how many people are on here right now? I can't, it doesn't show me. 23, yeah, 22, 22. Okay, and you are recording, right? So, yes. thank you. We'll, they'll be, this will be available to them. So, now you've got to take a look at what's going on here to make sure it makes sense to you. If I take a look at this right here, my waveform, oh my. I value of tau, and I made mention would be the number of points I have, 64 times TS. That would be my tau. Well, that value of tau, one over that value of tau is 15 points. You check that yourself. Just take 64 times 10 to the minus third and take one over it. And you'll get this value if you want to check, 15.625. Now I look at that plot, and I need to adjust this, so I'm going to look uh here i'm gonna do this i'm gonna put see i have grid limits from minus 50 to 50 i'm actually going to go from minus um minus 20 to 20 
you don't even have to do that. But when I do that, and I take a look at the plot. You can do this with me, by the way. If you have Octave or MATLAB, you can see the first zero is at 15.625. So that confirms that the code is operating correctly. After you do the adjustment with FFT shift, uh, and then you also have to move the frequencies, adjust the frequencies to center them at zero. Do you understand that, everyone? Can you explain one more time what FFT shift does? Uh, yeah. Um, if you look at a raw FFT, if we just plotted, not the, the value of this, but if I just plot the FFT right here, right, I'm going to do it right below there. And it's got to be the absolute value, by the way. You can plot the phase too if you want. And I'll just call it X, right? Well, for that, That's an FFT. Now, what do you see? You see that it goes, this is, if we adjust this, this would go from zero to pi here, but then from pi to two pi, all these things should be wrapped on this side over here. You follow me? So all it does is just shift it from it's zero taking to it pi to negative pi to pi? Well, it doesn't just shift the whole thing. It takes the frequencies from the effective pi point, midway point up to the two pi point, the end, takes those and wraps them down here and starts the, the pi point at minus pi. Now, if you do an FFT shift right here, and I take a look at that, and I'm just gonna plot this for you so you can see it. If I plot now XS right here, all right? Now you see how it's wrapped around the right way. Whoever, who asked this question? I did. The chat, all right. You all see, you see that, right? Can yep. you also explain in your plot of, it's like plot F minus F of N over That's two. Sort of, I think I can do it right here. First, does everybody see that now this looks like the proper FFT of a pulse? I mean, it's the proper Fourier transform of a pulse. Do you agree with that? As far as its signature, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. problem is the center frequency here. So now what you have to do is adjust the frequency so it will be interpretable in terms of a Fourier transform. So what you end up doing is this. Remember, I've created F up here on line 21. That is the actual delta F, the I there, is going to be the point you are. Now, I could let I start from minus N over 2, but I'm not going to do that. What I end up doing is this. I take F, that is the value here, and I subtract from it F of N, my, or N over 2. Now, F of N is the extent, the highest possible frequency. And then I have to subtract one more point, the delta, the, F, the, the change between 0 and the first frequency, because of the zero point. Remember, you have a zero frequency, everybody, right? That's the DC frequency that we don't account for unless we add that. Now when I do this, right? Take a look. Now I have an exact equivalent of my, as if I took a Fourier transform of that pulse, if it was a continuous time Fourier transform. Do you follow me? Yeah, is that how you would, um, it, like, is that the equation you would use for? No, no, no. This is, this is, MATLAB's doing this. I gave you the exact equation to use to take a look at a DFT or an FFT and multiply it. Remember, multiply X of K or the DFT of the function, you multiply by one minus E to the minus J omega, where omega is adjusted, it's two pi over N times. Right, 2 pi over NTS times K, right, over J, then that adjusted omega 2 pi N over T or over uh, NTS times K times the DFT. But that was a homework assignment. If you've done that, you should be clear about how to do that. How many remember doing that? All right. I remember doing that, but... um, Everybody should have done it. Well, like... Like I said, I, I remember doing it. It's just I didn't, none of my graphs were centered at zero. 
Well, it's because it was a single-sided Fourier transform from, from, from zero. It didn't go from negative omega. All the Fourier transforms that you, I mean, you could have gone from minus omega, actually, and it would have worked. But I, I did some of this a couple lectures ago. Do you remember this when I had spent time on this, people? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, uh, we, did, we did this. Today, I'm trying to just focus on this. Now, this is MATLAB effectively doing what I did with the FFT or the DFT and multiplying it by those constants that adjust this. I'm, MATLAB is doing this for me now. Follow me with that FFT shift. Now, when I have that, this is my point. You see that there's a whole lot of information. My, my real goal is to look from about uh, minus 20 to plus 20 for stars. Actually, minus 50 to plus 50 would be good. So what I'm going to do here is just go from minus 50 to plus 50, and you'll see why I'm doing it. And when I go here and take a look, now this is something I wanted to point out. You see how that first zero is at 15.625? That's the first maximum, right? Now, that maximum, I'm just telling you, is way too big because what happens is when we do real digital signal processing involving radar and stuff, this would be something, this signature would be shifted way out at a high frequency signal and, and another one. It'd be multiplied by a cosine of omega naught t, and that omega naught would be 2 pi times maybe 20 gigahertz. What they want to do is suppress this. They want to get this as small as possible, and this is where windowing comes in. Can you appreciate the reason why we're doing windowing? You're going to see it used in a second. Just keep that in mind. Normally, we don't look at things where there's a linear scale here. We look in terms of dB. So the next thing I'm going to do is plot this in a dB scale. And that's right below there. So I'm going to highlight, just comment that out. And then I'm going to go ahead and plot this. It's the same exact thing as above, only it's on in dB. It's 20 times the log 10 of the absolute value of x of s. Can everybody see what I'm doing? I'll slow down, but hopefully y'all can appreciate that. Now, when I do that, I just have to hit F9 to execute that. And, but I gotta dig that plot out. There it is in DB. Still way too much information. I don't care about all this stuff, these sidebands way out here. So the next thing I do is apply this. Now I'm looking at something in DB. And one other thing I need to do is put a grid on there. Can you follow me, everyone? Um, could you yeah. explain what DB is again? Pardon? Say again? Um, could you explain what DB is? Yeah. If we... When we talk about decibels, dB, what we do is this. If it's a voltage or a current, then 20 times the log base 10 of whatever, V or I, will be V in dB. If it's power in watts, then P in dB will be equal to 10 times the log of the power. This, this is just standard practice. Are you with me? How many have seen DB before? I have assumed you have. Could you give me a thumbs up if you have? Something that would indicate to me you have. One, two. You should have seen it in your I've lab. I've seen DB before, but not in, a, not in an electrical sense. It should have been in laboratory work or in physics. You should have seen it. Um, but decibels are used extensively because many times the dynamic range may be there may be 10 orders of magnitude of range. Well, you can't plot on a linear scale something with 10 orders of magnitude change and appreciate what's going on. You have to take the log of that so you can see what, in fact, the signature looks like. And that's the reason you do DB. And I wonder why this thing, there we go. It's an autofocus, but sometimes it doesn't focus well. Did that answer your question, whoever asked it? That helped, thank you. It's really something for scale. So let's shut that down. Now I come back to here and here's my point. You see the first from the very first one here to the second one here, 
the difference in the height is 13.56 dB. Now, I can't prove that right now, but if you actually can eyeball this and measure it, there's, what, 5, 10, it'll be 13.56 dB of difference. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. From the, This is the center. Mm -hmm. This is the, the peak right there is really tau, if you really want to know what it is. And this is going to be, well, it's 20 times the log of tau. So. And this here is, whatever this is, this right here is going to be, it's going to be 15 point, or 13.56 dB below it. Now, I'm, that number is going to be something you're going to hear over and over again. This is for a standard pulse. You send it, you more or less, this pulse gives you this. Here's where I'm going with this. When you say, send a radar signal, you send out pulses that are modulated by a high frequency signal that strike things in return. When we get them back, we look in the frequency domain and we get rid of the high frequency carry and we look at this, okay? That's what we see. But you see, there's something else that happens without getting into too much. There's a wobble. Sometimes you don't know if you're looking at this peak or you're looking at this peak, and there's a lot of problems. Now, here's what windowing buys you for now. If I take this, and now I'm going to go ahead, and don't worry about all that right here. Now I'm creating a window. All right, this is called a hamming window. It's very, very important. And I'll explain here what a window does. Uh, I'm going to do it, go back to my tablet and shut that or uh, pop that camera up so you can, I can explain it right here. And I'm going to start with a new piece of paper and hopefully this will make sense to everybody. So what a window does is this. When I have my standard pulse waveform, and I'm just putting the envelope here, we know this would be digital. Oh. Dr. Baginski, could you move the paper down? Thank you. How about if I move the camera up? I'm trying to do this in a way that everybody can get a visual sense. Can you all see that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this is simply a pulse of with tau of T, and it, it will be digital when we do it. But remember, there's a direct association between one and the other, right? The sampled signal is really what we're talking about when we do discrete signal processing. And I sometimes call it digital signal processing because that's truly what it is. Now, when I have this, I know I would get this. I would get tau times the sink of omega tau over two. I know that, and I know what that looks like. But if I take this window, or I take this and I multiply it by a window, so if I take t tau of t, and I multiply it by a window, call it a hamming window of t, now what that'll do is give me a signal in the time domain that'll look like this. It'll basically, not exactly down to zero, but close to it. It'll take that waveform, this pulse waveform, and it'll, it'll round the corners. All right, now you're saying, well, that's not the exact waveform, then the transform. That's all right. We know what this is gonna give us. But what happens out here is then, over here, we know we have this, if we talk about in dB. And this is minus 13.56 dB below that. Well, when we do the Hamming window, and I'll explain what the Hamming window is, then we get this. We get a slightly broader main lobe, but our next pulse is down by minus 40 dB, our next sideband. So the benefit of using a window is it greatly reduces the sideband or the next major lobe that you don't want. And I'll show you later why you don't want it. Now, follow me on this. I've got this laid out for you right here. So a hamming window, this is a hamming window, is given by 0.54 minus 0.46 times the cosine of 2 pi i. All right, remember uh, the 2 pi's in there, in this one. And it's divided by NH. Now, NH is important because NH up here is just the pulse length in terms of, it'd be 64. It would not have the TS multiplying. Does everybody follow me on that? Okay. If we're doing digital signal processing, we remove TS from that. And now we go down here and we say, if I take this Hamming window, and I multiply it by x. And remember, x up here 
is simply that pulse that I defined with a bunch of ones, 64 ones, then a bunch of zeros. Do you all remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when I do this with this window, I want you to take a look at what happens. And I'm going to do it right here. By the way, I should say this too. I go ahead and then after I multiply x by the window function, remember you have to have a dot multiply. Then I take x of h, that's the FFT of x of h. Still, that's not, that's not useful in itself. Then I do an FFT shift of that transform, just as I've done before. And then I take a look at what it looks like in the frequency domain with the adjusted frequencies, and I do it in dB, okay? Now watch this. And I think you'll understand it. So when I do that, I get this. You can't really see what's going on if I have the extent of this, because look at how far down it goes, right? So the first thing we do is we're going to limit the, the actual width of this thing. So the first thing I do is put a grid. And then I put grid limits. I have minus 80. That's OK to plus 80. And I'm also going to limit the y. I'm going to go from minus 30 dB all the way up to 50 dB. Now when I do that, hopefully it'll be a little more meaningful. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Every, what did you see happen? I'm going to contrast it to now it doesn't go down by 13 dB. It goes down by 40 dB right here. You all see that? Yes. That's mm -hmm. amazing. There is a broadening here. Now I'll contrast the two of them. So you'll see it. Let me. Uh, and then and hopefully it'll show it. Oops, there we go. All right, now, oh, something I didn't tell you. This is one of the things with this stuff, Windows. Um, it has to do with a few things, but you can see that there seems to be a difference in the multiple of the peak. You, you don't worry about that. The only thing I'm going to do here is now for my window right here, I'll just put a two right here. This is, this is absolutely allowable, and now I'll rerun all this. And here's what I wanted to show you. Take a look at the Hamming Windows output. It takes the, the first pulse. You can always adjust these things so they overlap. There, they start at the same point. The first sideband down here for an unwindowed pulse is down 13.56 dB. For the windowed pulse, it's down 40 dB. Now, there are many windows. There's Hanning Windows. There's Kaiser windows, there's Bartlett's windows, there's this whole lot, but I'm going to level with you. For radar signal processing, Hamming windows are used extensively because they have the minimal amount of broadening of the main beam. You see it broadens. It broadens by a factor of about 1.64 compared to this width, but the side lobe attenuation is phenomenal. Now, uh, how many know what Doppler frequency is? Give me a, just in a general sense. When I talk about a Doppler shift in frequency, if you know it, give me a thumbs up. One. Only one. Two. Well, what happens when you hear a race car coming at you? You hear something that basically goes, mm, then it passes you, and you're, mm, right? It sounds like the RPMs of the engine change, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they? No. What happens is, is you get a Doppler shift in the sound because as something's coming at you, the actual frequency is, or you could say that the wavelength is compressed to the transmitted sound, so it sounds higher pitch. When it's going away from you, the effective wavelength is extended or lengthened, so it sounds like a lower frequency. That's called a Doppler shift. There's Doppler shifts with electromagnetic energy if things are coming at you or going away from you. And what the Doppler shift does is, both at the high frequency 
uh, range. And then when we get it in what's called baseband, it takes this central frequency right here and it shifts it. So instead of being right here, this frequency might be here. But if I have a whole lot of sidebands like this, I may not be able to tell where in fact the Doppler shift center is. And that's why windowing is so important. I'll try to be more clear about this later when we get into applications, but I had to expose you to windowing in this lecture. Does everybody understand that? And that's the reason for it. There are a whole lot of windows, but it's used to attenuate the side lobes or the unwanted part of the frequency spectrum. The only thing we care about in most applications is just the main lobe. We would like to extinguish all these sidebands so we could just see where the main lobe is. Now, so, uh, Dr. Baginski, the, uh, for the Hamming window, is it always 0 0.54 or minus 0 0.4? Like, is it always that? Absolutely. That's the distinction of a Hamming window. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure, and, and the, you know what's really nice about this? Just think about this. The only thing I'm doing to the incoming data is what? I'm multiplying it by coefficients, right? I've just multiplied, I got incoming data, I collect the incoming data and I take from the first part of it and I multiply it by a coefficient. Now there's more to this, but believe me, this is the simplest and easiest to implement. It's called windowing. The next thing we talk about is called finite impulse response filters. And they have an unbelievable ability to get rid of everything you don't want, but they require a data record. Do y'all remember talking to me telling you that there's causal and non-causal responses to systems? Causal is something that the output is only based on the input or prior values. Non-causal would have to anticipate the input, right? Those are the non-realizable ones, right? It, yeah, non-realizable and real-time data processing. But I also said if you had a data record, if you had yeah. a record of data, then you could use a non-causal filter and it would be legitimate. And that's really what a fur filter is. <laughs> it's taking a data record and applying something that would otherwise be non-causal to it. And I'll show you that, but I think I'm going to show you that at another time. So I had to get through this today. Now. I have a feeling I'm gonna be answering questions. And you asked me, who, who was it asked me a question about? Uh, uh, it was me, I asked if you could kind of go over three or four. Uh, which, which homework? homework? Which homework? Uh, 23 part two. It's the MATLAB code. I just was a little confused by the verbiage of it, I guess. Uh, what is three? Three and four, you say? Is, is this one that I'm highlighting? Is yeah, three, three or four, either one. All right, uh, the Fourier transform system can be computed and compared to DFT. This is what we went on uh, by letting, this is what I was talking about today and using this for about part, directly compare the Fourier transform to the DFT using the relationship I think we did this one. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't we do these? I have no idea what's going on. Um, like, yeah. was there an actual something to solve for problem three? Or was that just information to use for part four? It's for part four. There's three of them, right? Four, one, four, two, and four, three. Okay, and I so think I did four, one for you as an example, didn't I? Yes, you did it. Oh, yeah. What was going on? um last friday <laughs> i don't know what's going on here but i see i've got do you have some jitter in these things or not and, no i don't know that doesn't you can all see this okay the main screen right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. all right well i've done that one i think i still have it uh, i think this is it Here's, first of all, uh, that was just a cosine waveform. And that's the adjusted DFT. Let me run this and see. Do you remember when we did this one? Okay, that's the simple cosine waveform. The thing I did before was I had, um, we had this, an FF, this is, 
if you think about the actual Fourier transform of a simple exponential, so if you made this, I'm not sure, was it exp to the minus, was it 3t or 2t? Anybody remember? Just minus t, I think. Minus t. Or four one. I think the first one, yeah, I think the first one was just, just negative t. Yeah, it's just negative t. I, I know the transform of that is just 1 over 1 plus j mega, right? I mean, do you mm -hmm. agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the omega, the adjusted omega. Right? So this would be the actual Fourier transform at discrete points in frequency. Then I take this waveform x of t, right? And I'm, uh, I'm going to sample it right here at a ts. So every ts seconds and ts is 1 over 100, I sample it. And when I do that, then I get an FFT right here. Correct, Klaus? Yeah. Can you also? Yep. All right, now mm -hmm. that, that again is the raw FFT or the DFT. They're one and the same for our purposes. Now I go ahead and I use that adjustment factor that I proved. And I say, if I have one minus EXP to the minus one J times omega, the omega calculated up here, times TS divided by one, j o times omega and again that's dividing by that one j omega and then multiplying it by the actual dft now i get the adjusted dft that i can directly care compare to the fourier transform so here uh first i plot the i'm going to plot the the xft is the last part the adjusted um the actual adjusted a value is here, the adjusted DFT. So when I run this, and here they're indistinguishable, but you look at the, there's, there's only information of, of really of interest out to 10, so I can limit this. Um, when I do the plot, I can say x limit uh, 0, 10. Hopefully that'll do it. And you can see they're very, very close. Can, can you see that, whoever asked? Uh, yeah. And the whole purpose of the exercise is to see, in fact, if the difference in the value of x of t and x of t plus delta t is small, then in fact you can do this adjustment and you can directly compare the actual Fourier transform of any signal to the sampled signal and it'll be the same. What it's really beneficial is suppose I have a signal that I have the DTT, suppose I capture a signal in time and then I take the DFT of it and I want to see what it looks like in a domain that I understand which would be the Fourier transform domain well, if I adjust it as like this, I go ahead and I take one minus e to the minus j omega ts over one j omega times the dft. Now I can look at it and say, oh, I see what that signal is. It looks like a, you know, an exponential or it looks like a exponential times a cosine and those signatures are fairly well understood or it looks like a couple of different cosine frequencies. Now, when I do the FFT shift and all that, I do the effectively do this, all right? You know how I take the FFT shift and then I adjust the frequencies? Remember what I was doing earlier? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's doing the same thing. <laughs> That's basically doing the exact same thing, only MATLAB's doing it without telling me what it's doing. Okay? Okay, that makes sense. Now, let's get back to this test business and, um, things we have to cover for the exam. So for the exam, you know there's four basic things that are gonna be covered. Uh, and there may even be a bonus. There's gonna be convolution, continuous time convolution. I'm not gonna give you discrete convolution. There's gonna be the Fourier series analysis, right? That's something for periodic functions. Then there's going to be a question about the Laplace transform. 
I had a question about the continuous time Fourier transform. Those are the four main things. I may throw a bonus, I haven't decided yet. I'm, I'm trying to get a little more data on that, that would involve a DF or DTFT, something that, that you would, something fairly easy, but those are the four more main areas. The way the, the, what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is during the test, I would like you to, uh, I'll send the test out via email and you can either capture it with your camera, put it on a tablet or take a picture of it, however you wanna do this and work the test and then either take a picture or just take the out your tablet and take that, put it into a Word document and one problem per page, make sure the answers are boxed and upload those to Dropbox. Now, there'll be a time window so that the, I will start this about, it'll, you'll probably get the email uh, 15 minutes before class starts, but you'll have until 15 minutes after class starts to upload it and take care of everything. And it will not be made out, so you're gonna use all that time. It'll be made out for a standard 50 minute test, but there's a lot of leeway for technical difficulties and we'll see how it goes, okay? Dr. Baganski. Yeah. Can we just write, uh, once you send us the test, can we just write our solution on a piece of paper um, and just like, you know, write number one and then just do it on one piece of paper and then just take pictures of each of our answers and then put on a Word document and submit that? Yeah, you can write, you, you can it. longhand write, sure. Okay, you don't need it on the actual test, like we don't need to print the test out. No, no, well, I, I, I would, <laughs> This is just me personally, because I'm going to have boxes there. And I, when I'm grading these things, I need to see what your final answer is clearly. I don't want to look around because there's going to be very little partial, if any partial credit at all in these tests. Uh, I want to see your final answers, final forms. They've got to be clear. And that's the reason I want a box around them. There's, so there's no ambiguity. And then the other thing I'm going to tell you is um, what I'm really looking for is uh, the steps. They should be very clear to me what you're thinking and doing. Uh, like if you're doing a convolution problem, you, you, it's got to be clear to me. This is the one I'm going to flip for what reason. Now I flip it. Now I shift it. Now I see the different domains where uh, from T equals zero to two, it's one thing. From two to four, it's another. From four to six, it's another and so forth. And it's very clear to me what you're doing. There's, so there's no chance that I would misinterpret things, okay? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm gonna also do this, and this is a suggestion. I would like everybody when they're doing it to have your cameras on, all right? And you don't have to have your audio on, but have your cameras on because I'm gonna be just gazing at people. And I'd like everybody to make sure that they have their cameras on. I'm asking you to be on your honor system to not collaborate with people. Uh, I mean, obviously there's people that they're clever. If you want it, be underhanded, you can. I'm asking you not to do that. I'm not sure how many different versions of the tests are gonna be made yet, but I'm working on it. And uh, I'm not gonna use honor lock or anything like that, but I am going to ask you to make sure you have your camera on. I'll be sitting here watching and uh, the one thing I'm gonna tell you, this is gonna be open book, open notes. So that should help, but it usually hurts because people spend a lot of time reading about something they feel uncertain of and it kills their overall performance. I found that to really be a problem. So time. am I understanding that you want us to log into Zoom as well? I'll send you a Zoom link. Okay, um, and can you explain, I don't, I don't think I've ever used Dropbox before like how does that uh, you don't have to use Dropbox you're gonna put it on canvas okay so it'll be a, a submission in canvas yeah and the other thing that um, Lydia mentioned is a uh, uh, a session tomorrow where I could even do a dry run of the test more or less just to make sure that there's no bugs so we can probably do that let me just check my meeting schedule make sure somebody I don't have a meeting that I don't know about yeah cuz we had something similar, I guess, on Friday with uh, Power, with Dr. Gross, and it, I guess, uh, originally on Friday went really poorly. We ended up having to retest this morning. He had to remake the test, uh, 
multiple choice. That happens, brother. So here's what we can do tomorrow. Um, at 11 o'clock tomorrow, we can do a dry run and I'll answer questions, okay? Um, can we, we're not there. There. I can't hear you. What? What if we have class? Yeah, I've got a lab right then. Same. All right, I got a nine o'clock meeting. I got a 9.30 to 10.45 radar class. I got a one o'clock meeting, it looks like. I've got a doctor's appointment. I got a, I'm free to left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just left with you. Uh, was it supposed to be like a dry run this morning or did I miss that? I, I was gonna do that, but it, I, I'm looking at the material we have to cover and we're behind by a lecture and a half. So I had to go through that today. There's just, but there wasn't one, right? Like I didn't no. miss it. No, 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 there wasn't, there wasn't one. I mean, I, I'm looking at everything I've got going on. Uh, what is this? Oh, one other thing, Dr. Beginsky. Um, are you going to post a separate thing on Canvas for the homework from part two? Wasn't it there? No. No. Uh, yeah, right. the, uh, yeah, I was going to mention that as uh, well. The homework that, that's due today, I guess. Yeah, why don't I do that right now? Uh, just just stay with me so if there's a problem, I can deal with it right now. So if I go to Canvas. Will you also be posting the grades that we make on Canvas? Uh, I didn't plan on posting any grades on Canvas. I, was, uh, I, I always hand back the stuff when I'm done. So you have them with you. You don't have to worry about not knowing your grade because I'll get the, I'll print this out and grade them and send it to you. Let me get this. Uh, normally, I always hand back everything, so you have your grades. You never have to worry about them. Which side of you guys are in Auburn? I know there's a bunch, but I don't know percentage-wise. How many people out of the class are still in Auburn? Can you somehow indicate it? And Lydia, can you give me a head count? Because Bird, General Bird just wanted to know that. At least uh, four or five. Yeah, let's just make a poll on the group chat, I guess. Um, yeah, we can do that. The general wants to know this for a bunch of reasons, because if there's a sufficient number of students, they're probably going to do things that benefit students like, I don't know, food pickup or something. I know of at least about four or five of us, but well, I'm not sure in general, the whole class. There's nobody living on campus, so they try to get everybody off campus, but uh, there, there seems to be a sufficient number of students around here that people are thinking about, well, how about supplying us with safe food, somewhere we could get takeout and we know that, in fact, it's not going to be tainted. Then. And that's reasonable. I think you're going to get reimbursed for your dining. I mean, those, uh, all that money you put into the, your Tiger card stuff. Uh, it's, I guess it's going to be prorated based off of how much you have left. That makes so sense. I guess, for instance, if you get, you know, $300 a month and we made it, what, three months into the semester. So you should have used $900 by now. If you have a thousand in your account, they would refund you the hundred dollar difference. If you have hey, less is, than a, less than nine hundred or whatever, then you wouldn't get the remaining balance. I guess. Okay. Now this is going to be homework number three or twenty three part two, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. All right. Just work with me here. If you got to go, Ruth, go ahead. Okay. Uh, what time are you going to make it due uh, for the homework turn in? 
about five o'clock. Okay. Today can you go, is, go ahead. Uh, can you go ahead and restate uh, what the problem types will be for the test? I just like to go ahead and write them down for reference. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, it's con I'm trying to do this other thing, but convolution. It's a convolution Fourier series analysis, uh, Laplace transfer, continuous time Fourier transfer, and there may be a bonus of DFT. Thanks. That's right. This is five PM. Tell me if you see it, it'll be a second. It should be homework 23 part two. People? I see it. Yep, okay. just refreshed. Just stick it in there at your homeworks. And I tried, I tried downloading some of these. Uh, I knew it was going to be a lot of weird stuff happening. Everybody's told, they've warned us to expect problems. And I don't think anybody's had a smooth thing go on, really go forward with a test or anything other than that honor lock stuff. And that's multiple choice. Who had a test in honor lock around here? I, I had one just the other day. And it's just multiple choice, right? Yeah. I mean, they didn't really give a, uh... I think there was some fill in the blank, like maybe like one or two, but I, I just can't do that to students. I'm not in engineering. I know Birch does that, but that that is that's so foul. All right, now other questions since this is technically my office on. Dr. Biginski, I had a few questions about um one of them was like a shifted for continuous time. What? It, it was from one of the previous homeworks. Yeah, sure. Uh, it was from homework 19. All right, let me get it up. Let me get it up. Homework 19? Uh, yes, sir. Which one? Question 2-C. It's the, the third one where it's shifted <laughs> over and yeah. it's not centered. Okay. Now, you can, that's a good question. We'll try to go through this. This is a real good question. So I'm going to try to do it here. And there should be a way for me to get a full page view here, but I'm not sure. Well, you can all see that pretty much, right? All right, if I... Here's the problem that you're talking about. And um, where was it centered, by the way? Uh, one half. 
just not one half pi, one half? Uh, yes, sir. And it goes out to one? Yes, sir. And this is the omega domain, mm -hmm. right? What's the height? Uh, one. All right. Now this is really a function in the frequency domain. So this would be a triangle function. It would be a width one, and it would be centered at omega minus one half. Can you all see that? Yes, sir. That would be the definition of this right here. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is use duality. And the first thing I'm gonna do is say, I know that a triangle function of any width of t goes to tau over two times the sinc function of omega tau over four and or uh, hang on for one second I, i'm actually trying to find out where this is in your book because i uh six squared i'm sorry uh six squared uh, but that i'm trying to find out where it is He does this one somewhere. I, miss. I don't know where he does it. He, he has it in here somewhere. And it might be a problem in the back of the book. Anyway, I went through this with you. Do you all remember this right here, class? Nick? Yes. Mm -hmm. Of the duality that threw me off yeah, I'm going to use duality, but first, this is our first starting point, okay? Now, I know this ahead of time. I know because this is a left shift, or it's minus, over here, it's actually going to end up being a right shift. I can tell you that now because I've done these things too long. So now what I'm going to do is say, if that's the case, then if I have this, did I just get kicked off? Can you all see me still? Yeah, you're still here. Someone else left. And I have T plus, and I'll just put it um, A. I'll just use A. Now over here, what happens? Now I'm going to have E to the J omega A, right? Times tau over 2 times the sinc squared of omega tau over 4. Do you agree with me there? Remember, if it would be minus a here, then it would be e to the minus j omega a, correct? Mm -hmm. Everybody with me on that? All right. Now, use duality. So first, I'm going to go from frequency to time, and I'm going to replace omega by t. So I have e to the j a t times tau over 2 times the sinc squared of t tau over four. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Then I come over here and I say that over here, this is gonna be two pi times instead of t, it's gonna be minus omega. So it's this sub tau of minus omega plus a. Agreed? So minus omega plus a equals zero, and therefore omega equals a is where that's centered. Do you agree with me? Yes. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is divide by two pi. So this is centered there. And I have that, right? Mm -hmm. Now I look at my original function up here. I notice the width is one, one, 
one, correct? Yes, sir. Cole and Jeffrey and Nick, can you see this? Yes. <laughs> All right, now the only thing I have to do is what? A is what? Uh, one half. Look, A is what? A. This is centered at A, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A is a half, right? Yeah. Follow me, Lydia, you mm -hmm. ask this, you see? All right, so if it's a half, you replace that by a half. So you would have e to the j t over two, over then it would be four pi, right? Then you would have tau, which is one over, I already took the four over here, times the sink squared of, in this case, tau is one, it's just t over four. Um, Dr. Baginski, could you move your page up a little bit? please. <laughs> Thank you. Here's what I've done. I've just taken and I replaced A and tau, and this is what you get. Agree? Yes. Nick? So uh, my, my only concern here is that for, for the, the pulse that's in omega, we have a negative omega plus A still, correct? Doesn't matter. That could be minus matter. A plus omega. You could put omega plus uh, omega minus A. They're the same thing. Is that why we started out with P plus A since we knew that it was going to be flipped over the... Um, I know this, that because I'm going to replace T with minus omega, I know a right mm -hmm. shift here would correspond to a left shift in time. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason I intuitively put a plus A there and let A be constant, let A be positive. Okay, so if it was like a right shift, we would put a T minus A, so we would know that it would be a minus omega minus A, which well, would... Well, yeah, it, it, here's how it's real simple. If you're in the omega domain and you see something shifted right, okay, mm -hmm. that means in the T domain, it would be shifted left when you do, if you're using duality. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. I think I'm on board with that. Just play a few around with these. And that's a good problem, by the way, because it makes you think. It really does make you think. Uh, I have another question from another homework. Um, there are several. So Which one? It's from homework 11, question 432. I believe it's an op amp one. Or, oh, hold on, let me, let me get it. Matter of fact, let me move this stuff over here so I can uh, just have that. You know, there should be a way I cast this camera directly to you. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe not. I don't know, play with it right now. Anyway, if, um, uh, which one was that again? It's from homework 11, uh, question 4-32. I believe it's an op amp question. It's 432 in the book as well. 432? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that op amp. Yes, sir. They wanted the transfer function, right? Yes, sir. That's a good problem. Um, all right, uh, so let me just do this. Is that first resistor? I can't tell if that's R1, R2. First resistor is R1. Then they have R2. Did, didn't we work this one? Yes, sir. It's just my notes weren't really clear on it, um, unfortunately. So That's all right. And then they've got a C2 here. Uh, we've got a C1 here. And this is your output, right? Yes, sir. 
and this is the input V source. All those grounds are tied together. A lot of ways to do this. Um, probably what I can do is this. This is V naught right here, correct? To ground? Yeah. So I know this is V naught here, right? Yes. yes. That means I know right there that's V naught, right? Mm -hmm. That means I know this current. This impedance right here would be one over SC2, correct? Mm -hmm. So I can yes. call that current I1. I1 is equal to simply V naught divided by one over SC2, right? So this is really SC2 times V naught would be I1, correct? Yes. I1 is also flowing there, correct? Mm -hmm. That means the voltage here, I'll call it V prime, V prime would be equal to I1 times R2 plus really one over SC2. There's some redundancy in here. You're going to see that this is just going to make that V naught right there. But do you agree with that? I have I1, assuming V naught, then I have V prime, right? So it's you want, okay, so it's times the impedance. That makes sense. That's really, I'm just taking I1 times R2 plus one over SC2. Okay, that makes sense. Thank now, once I, have, once I have that voltage right there, I also necessarily have this current, don't I? Yes, I would have that current, and I can call that I2 if I want. This is just one way of doing it. I can say that I2 here would be equal to V prime minus V naught over 1 over 1 over C1S, or just times SC1. And that would be I2, correct? Can you slide it down just a touch? This way? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You all see what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. It's just, yes. it's really piecework. I say that's I1. If I've got I1, assuming I know V naught, V out, then I can get, if I, I can get I1, I can get the current through here. I can get the voltage here by taking R2 plus 1 over SC2 times I1. If I have the voltage here and subtract from it V out and divide it by 1 over 1 over SC1, I have the current here, which is I2. Then I can say the current here would be I2 plus I1 plus I1 would be the current here. And that current times R1 would be the voltage drop here. So I can say that Vs would be equal to the voltage drop here which is R1 times I1 plus I2, right? And then it's going to be that plus V prime, correct? Yes, sir. Now, you can see what I'm up to. I have I1 in terms of V naught. I have I2 in terms of V naught, right? All right, I, I'm sorry, I have V prime in terms of V naught. I have I2 in terms of V prime and V, really V prime and V naught. Now I can take all these three things and stick them in there and get one equation, can't I? Okay, so you just substitute back in and then you can find the transfer function. Okay. Abs absolutely, and if I can do it, I've did it before, but the real truth of the matter is it's plugging and chugging and just uh, after that, it's getting into a form that's reasonable to understand. Okay, that makes sense. That answered my question. My, my biggest concern was getting the I1s and I2s to line up correctly, so. Now here's, you can use node along this one. I didn't for a reason. Uh, it can get a little, I'd say confusing, but if you want nodal, really, you've got a voltage here that's unknown, right? Mm -hmm. You have a voltage here that, that is sort of known and a voltage here that is sort of known. You have to, when you use nodal, you have to find a ratio of V out over VS. It's a little more, I'd say confusing. Okay. Um, I have another question from old homeworks. So I believe it's homework 12, question four. Uh, homework 12, question four. Oh yeah, block diagram. Yeah. Matter of fact, let me just talk. It's, can you all see it right there what I pulled in? Uh, could we expect to possibly see a block diagram on the test mm -hmm. or is it unlikely? 
No, it's, it's obviously it's you got to be prepared for that. That's that's common too, because it's common with Z transforms. It's common with DTFT. It's it's extremely common. Okay. This is your standard negative feedback network, by the way. What do we do with these two top blocks, anyone? We look to simplify them, right? They're in series, aren't they? Do you, do you multiply them? Just multiply them together. What do we do with these two? You multiply them as well since they're... Right. Now you have one forward block, right? Divided okay. by one plus this forward block times this, right? Okay. What would you... I think I can do this here. So my gain, my forward gain, I'll call it A right here. Uh, and it would be a function of S. A would be equal to simply this, maybe I can cut and paste this, which would be the best for me, would be that, right? And then it would be times two over S, right? Follow me? Yes, sir. That's the forward gain, the reverse gain, the beta would be equal to simply four times three or 12 over, over S plus three, right? Mm -hmm. oh, 12 over 12 over S plus three, sorry. So what's the total gain of the system? That's negative feedback. Your H of S would be what? Is it S plus three or S plus two? That box. Oh, it's two, you're right, thank you. All right, so your total gain here would be equal to A over 1 plus A times B. Do y'all remember that? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and now you put the numbers in and you just simplify. But when you do that, you're going to see some things happen. Very first thing when you look here, just look at this. S plus two over S squared plus three S plus two. Well, isn't that, just look at this. If you have S plus two times S plus one. And factors and simplifies. All right, the S plus two goes away and you're left with one over S plus one, right? Correct. So mm -hmm. just put down one. And this would just be S plus one, right? Right? Right. And then you can see you have just two over S plus one over, uh, times S. Now for B down there, look what happens when you multiply the two together. Uh, That's A divided by one plus A. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that's the original A, not the reduced, the reduced form. You're right. You're absolutely right. Let me do this. Okay. You all see this? Mm -hmm. Right. Now yes. multiply top and bottom by S plus one. So then you get S plus one here. The S plus one goes away here. Right? Mm -hmm. Multiply both sides by S, then you get S squared plus S plus two over S plus two. And you can keep on multiplying it out. If you, it'd probably be easier for me to do it over here, but 
Do you all see what I'm doing? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. It'll eventually become a very trivial problem. Um, if you do this, you're going to have, let's see, two over, over one plus Okay, I'm kind of doing it myself. I get S plus that. Uh, and I multiply by S. And then I multiply, get that out of it, by S plus 2. Did you all do it? Mm -hmm. I'm working on it a little bit. So if I just look from here, what I have, if I multiply, if I just multiply top and bottom by S, I get a two upstairs, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get, S squared. Matter of fact, let me just do it this way. I'll group it like this. And then I get rid of this S. Right? I still have the two. You follow me? Yeah. Then I multiply top and bottom by S plus two. That gets rid of this S plus two. This becomes 24. Uh, it's that, right, times S plus 2. You agree with me? That's, that's yes. Right. And then yeah. uh, you can go ahead and multiply it out if you want, but you're going to have S. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. Where'd it go? I think it sent you up a tab. It should be in homework 12. Homework 12, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then yeah. when you do that, now you can multiply this out, but you're going to get S cubed plus 3S squared plus 2S plus 24 downstairs, right? Mm -hmm. Plus 26, correct? Wouldn't you also have? No, because there's an S multiplying. See that S, S is times this whole thing. There's 24. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, agree? And that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you were to take like the um, H of T of that, could you do that? Sure, you do partial frat. Well, this one's a little tougher, right? Because look, you got that 24 in there, see? Okay. You don't have, the poles aren't as simple as you think, unless I'm missing something. I don't um, think I asked for H of T for this one, do I? Uh, no, sir. I was just yeah. wondering if, if that, would, like, that see, would be reasonable if like to find the H of T of that. Well, <laughs> not in this class, because look, how are you going to factor that easily? Yeah. It's, it's you a could bit. do it. All right, there, there's a way to do it, but uh, that's a trickier one. Um, speaking about partial fractions, I had a quick question about partial fraction expansion when you Go have ahead. like um an s squared plus three or something in like the denominator or something that you uh, would need an as plus b why don't you think of this um first i don't know if i have tables here easily that you can see um it, 
I don't know where the table, if I have tables up here or not. I, I, I gave you some tables somewhere, didn't I? Um, I don't really distinctly remember any of for the partial fraction, but it's... No, I mean, tables of Fourier transforms. There's oh, some. Okay. Yeah, there's some transforms tables, right? Yes. All right, sir. now, if you look, the two, the two functions that always have an S squared plus omega squared in them are going to be either the sine of omega naught t, Sine of omega naught t is always going to be omega naught over s squared plus omega naught squared, right? Yes. Or the cosine of omega naught omega naught t, right? The cosine is always going to be what? Um, it would be s over s squared plus omega naught squared. Right, and I don't know if I have a cosine anywhere. Uh, Dr. Beginsky. Uh huh. Uh, my question was mostly if you don't, if it doesn't factor out to be s squared plus omega naught squared, and if it's just like um, an s squared okay. with something that can't really be factored. And because, like, there, I don't distinctly remember I mean, a problem with that, but there let was. Let me try to answer that. Um, I think you're talking about something. By the way, the gross have you turned your doc cams on, I mean, your uh, cameras on or not? When you, you took the test? Um, I, didn't, I, didn't you have a test? Who had a test with gross? Anybody in here? I think Jeffrey might have, but Lydia, neither Lydia or I did. Okay. Uh, my thermodynamics professor, Dr. Harris, he had us turn on the cameras um, when we were taking the test as well. That's what I want. Um, that, that's a good, good idea. So for th this, this doc cam has changed my life. <laughs> see, see these, lit, the two down here? Uh, yes, sir. 13 and 14 in your book. Those are the ones you go to. If you got something that's an S squared plus an AS or something constant S, plus something squared. This is, these are the ones you go to, these two. Okay, okay. Um, I, I was thinking about that, but like, if it was something where you had to do like an AS plus B, um, you know how if you had like a, two fractions that were multiplied together, like an S plus one times an S squared plus three, uh, mm -hmm. or S squared plus four, you would have to, partial fraction expansion. Yeah, yeah, and, and remember with the partial fractions, if you've got, you always do the simple folds first, right? Yes, sir. Then after that, the easiest way to do it is whatever's remaining, go ahead and get a common denominator and just equate the coefficients in the numerators. Okay. <laughs> it, it really, in my opinion, is the easiest way. Okay. So you get the common denominator of the first one and then you equate both? Yeah, let me try to write it down for you so you can see this a little better. So if I, you know, teaching like this is kind of a challenge to me, but I'm getting used to it sort of. Uh, so what you're saying is suppose we have something like s plus a times s squared plus 5s plus 6, right? Yes, sir. Something like this. And suppose on top we have 3s plus 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, the probably the easiest way to do this would be some constant a over s plus a would be the first one. And maybe I should make it two to make it exact. All right. Then you would have plus, now it, because the highest power there is S squared, I have to add a BS plus C. I have to have whatever the power is downstairs on, I have to have the numerator to have that power less one times a constant in all the way down to something times S to the zero. So I have BS plus C divided by s squared plus 5s plus 6. Now, the first thing you solve for is a. a, you cover this up, right? Mm -hmm. 
and you evaluate what's left over at minus two. So you would have three times minus two is minus six plus four is minus four, correct? Yes, sir. And then you would have minus two squared is simply four. And this is gonna be five times minus two is minus 10, right? Yes, so sir. four minus 10 is minus six, right? Plus six. <laughs> uh. that's, that's an odd guess of a thing. Let's see. Um, that's a singularity, which I didn't call. That means I have something where, what is this factor to? That's S plus 2, S plus 3. That's the problem. This is 3S plus 2 over S plus 2, right? And this is S plus 2 times S plus 3, correct? Yes, sir. So it'll be S plus 2 squared. Right, I have a double pole. So I have to have F, S A over S plus 2 plus b over s plus 2 squared, and then plus c, I didn't think this one through, s plus 3. Then you would solve for each one of those individually, right? Uh, how would you handle the s plus 2 squared for b? Won't be a problem. If you remember how you do this, first you're going to get this pole, right? Yes, sir. All right, once you get that, I'm assuming you know how to do it. Now you multiply everything by S plus two squared, right? Okay. Now you get B. So B would be, would be at, at S equals minus two. You put minus two there. So I have three times minus two is minus six uh -huh. plus two is minus four, right? Okay. And then I have minus two plus three is one. So this would be minus four would be. That makes sense, okay. And then what you have, how do you get A? You can do it, I told you the trick on this one. What do you do? Multiply both sides by s plus 2 squared, right? Mm -hmm. And then take the derivative of what remains with respect to s mm -hmm. and evaluate that with the, at the pole of s equals minus 2. That's the derivative method. Do you remember? Uh, yes, sir. The other way to do it is get a common denominator. Since I already have c and b, now I put everything under a common denominator, which is this. See what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And then you would get the coefficient. So here you would have uh, the coefficient here would be a times s plus two times s plus three. And then you'd have to get the coefficient of b would be times s plus two. And the coefficient of c would be s plus two squared. And you'd have to go ahead and do all the, expand them out and gather the coefficients of s squared, s, uh, s and you know, the constant term and equate them. We did this, do you remember that? Uh, yes, sir. I definitely remember going over in your office hours, but it was a little fuzzy. Um, okay, that answers my question for that. I do have one last question um, from the homework. So it is another one that we did in class, but I'm still not 100% sure about the derivation of this problem. So it's from homework 18. It's a three-parter. Um, it's A, B, and 18, did you say? 18, uh, question number one. Okay, hold on. Homework 18. Question number one. Yes, sir. Which one? I think there is, it's three parts to it. Um, so it's finds, let me look it up. We found x of e to the minus at u, u of t. We found yeah. that, well, that's no problem. Then we use linearity to get the second part. Yes, sir. Uh, my, my biggest question was with um, steps two and three. I wasn't sure of, I couldn't get it exactly in the form. Um, and my answer didn't quite line up with the answer that you provided. So it was a little bit of like, I'm pretty sure I'm making like a small error on my end, but I haven't been able to track it down. So I was just wondering if we could go over um, parts two and three. Yeah. Uh, we'll just do this real quick. So first we know if we have e, call it x of t, equals e to the minus at u of t, that goes to one over a plus j omega, right? Mm -hmm. And in the book,
It doesn't have time reversal in here for some reason. Um, but x of minus t goes to x go transfer x of minus omega. That should be in there, and maybe I'm not seeing it. Um, I, I can tell you how you can prove this. You see this x of a t? Uh, yes, sir. All right, let a be minus one. So this would be x of minus t would go to one over minus one, mm -hmm. x of omega over minus one, that's x of minus omega. Mm -hmm. So you, you can prove it that way. So this x of minus t goes to x of minus omega, and that means x of minus t right here would go to one over a minus j omega. Now, mm -hmm. x of minus t, all right, for the record, x of minus t is equal to e to the a t times u of minus t, correct? Yes, sir. That's where that would go. He wants the transform in there of uh, he wants the transform of e to the minus, I'm going to say a, it looks like alpha, but a t, but it's magnitude of t. E to the minus a magnitude of t. Well, that's really equal to x of t, right? Mm -hmm. Times plus x of minus t. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Well, the transform of that right there will go to one over a minus j omega plus one over a plus j omega, correct? Yes, sir. All right, now go ahead and, and get a common denominator. So I have a uh, plus j omega plus a minus j omega over a minus j omega times a plus j omega. And that's gonna be two a over a squared plus omega squared. Yes, sir. That's, right, that, that's what x of omega is, right? Yes, sir. All right, now you wanna use duality, okay? So I have x of t or e to the minus a times magnitude of t goes to this, right? Yes, sir. Use duality, come down here. It would be 2a over a squared, right, plus t squared, correct? Mm -hmm. Over here, it's what? 2 pi times e to the minus a times what? t becomes? Uh, omega. A minus omega, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's absolute value, it's just, just put of omega. Right? Correct? Yes, sir. All right, now look at his transform, what he wants. This is absolutely correct, correct? Uh, no. Does he have the answer to this one, by the way? Uh, I think I put the answer down. What is there? Um, um, he asked to determine the Fourier transform of one over one plus t squared. That's fine. Um, All right, now this, this is x of t, right? Yes, sir. And this is x of omega, correct? Yes, sir. All right, now I wanna do two things. First, I wanna get rid of this two, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I got rid of that. Now, Now I'm gonna say, what is x of 3t? Well, x of 3t, if, if I... Um, um, also, I, wait, a quick question. Is that a 2 pi or a a in the second part of the duality? Let, let me go ahead and, uh, it's 2 pi. Okay. Um, let me start from here and this will be the last problem because I got some other stuff coming up. Um, when I take a look at, uh, I'm just going to put this down, e to the minus a times the magnitude of t, that transforms as 2a over a squared plus omega squared, right? Yes, sir. All right, duality, bring that over to here. I have 2a, a squared plus omega squared, or I mean t squared, so t squared goes to 2 pi, right? 
Okay. And then it's going to be e to the minus a magnitude of omega, correct? Yes, sir. This is my new x of t. Yes, sir. This is my new x of omega. Yes, sir. Now, what I'm going to do is, what is x of 3t going to be? Well, that would be 2a over a squared plus quantity 3t squared, right? Yes, sir. And what is dual? I mean, what does that scaling property say? That goes to 1 over 3, right? Just okay. look at the property uh, 3 on page 229 times 2 pi times e to the minus a, right? And what is it going to be? Omega is going to be divided by omega divided by 3, correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm getting there. Now, what do I need to do to make this exact? Now I've got something of the form where I got the 3t squared. I want to divide top and bottom of this by a squared, correct? Yes, sir. If I do that, now I get 2 over a over 1. Actually, let me do it this way. Let me just do it this way. I have 2a over a squared plus 3t squared, right? Yes, sir. Goes to 2 pi over 3 e to the minus a over omega over 3, right? Yes, sir. The one I want is 1 over 1 plus 3t squared. That's the one I want, right? So if I let a be equal to 1, and then I get 2 over 1 plus 3t squared, we'll go to 2 pi over 3. Since a is 1, it's e to the minus, and it would be magnitude of omega over 3, actually, correct? Yes, sir. Well, divide both sides by 2. So pi over 3 e to the minus magnitude of omega over 3 would be the transform of 1 over 1 plus 3t squared. Oh, okay. I, I think I see my issue. Um, okay, that makes sense. It's a good problem. <laughs> it's a harder problem, but it's a good problem. And you can do this symbolically on MATLAB. That's the beautiful thing. And I think I do a lot of this. MATLAB's kind of great for this stuff. Yes, sir. And you can, you know, you can download a symbolic toolbox on Octave, I'm told, and do it on Octave too. And I've been using Octave. Mm -hmm. uh, you see in the cast screen there, but I'll tell you, Octave. I have this. I have Octave on my other computer. I think I don't think I have it on this one. Octave is fine. It's just it's not as pretty the plots, but they're the same thing. Now, I suppose I could keep working problems forever, but uh, I think you get an idea of what's going on. I know, I know there's been a lot of time passed since uh, we should have had our first test, but this whole disaster came upon us. And so we'll have it on Wednesday. And if you have questions, I'm gonna be available at 11. I know no matter what time I make it, I'm not, somebody's gonna not be able to hit it, but just, are you gonna be there at 11 or not? Uh, I will try to be, um, I have a class at 12.30, so I should be there at 11, though. Can you record it? Yes, sir. All right. It may not be a full hour or anything, but uh, see, I got a 9.30, 10.45 class, and then I got this one right after. All right. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. Right. Thank you, you Dr. Too. Baginski. You Take care, guys.